headlights. Oh, he smashed that one. The inside stories. Abe was waiting for me. The characters. Both of them. Hadley. Richards. The most explosive Australian cricketer of our time. And one of the most outspoken opens up. Dino. It's out on video and a must for every cricket lover. Taylor, McGrath, Goff's hat-trick. You watched it and loved it. Now Australian Cricket Video brings you the best of this year's Anset Australia Ashes Test Series to keep forever. The Ashes Triumph on Video. Two hours of magnificent action of Mark Taylor and his men as they rout England 3-1. Also on video, Dino. The gritty comments of Australian batting great Dean Jones at his absolute best. Plus one-day wonders from the 80s and 90s on video. Catch your Australian Cricket Videos at these stores now. Affectionately known to us as the fruit fly, you know, because he's an absolute pest. He never um, shuts up. He's talking all the time, as, as everybody would know on the cricket field. But I suppose what you see on the field is more or less what you get with Merv. Uh, he's boisterous and likes to have a good time, have a bit of joke, and always doing a quick joke or the one line or something. And is always making you laugh, and most of the time he makes you feel pretty good. <laughs> You don't set out to, to become a, a character or a cult figure. If you're worrying about that and your performance isn't up to scratch, and basically in the early days I, I had my hands full just trying to get some wickets to, to gain credibility there. Um, probably things turned around for me in uh, the test, about my sixth test I think it was from memory against uh, the West Indies, my first test against the West Indies in Perth. Jeff Lawson got hit by a bouncer in our first innings. I'd taken five wickets in the West Indies first innings, they batted first, Jeff Lawson got hit, um, and I got uh, I got a few wickets in the, in the second innings, eight wickets, so 13 for the game. Big shout on that occasion, Richie Richardson doesn't even uh, wait to look at the umpire. The battle has been a hard one. Overweight through the winter months saw him fight the battle of the bulge, and then the critics bagged the big Victorian that he wasn't up to test standard. After 13 wickets on the wagger, Merv has arrived to carry the mantle as Australia's number one strike bowler. I think this game was test standard. Yeah. Um, the other seven I've played, uh, I've just, I think I've let myself down by um, just getting a bit nervous and, and maybe having um, self doubts, you know, thinking maybe I'm not good enough to be there. Well, Merv always thought he could get knocked over Viv a fair bit, and Viv had the new haircut or the lack of hair, shall we say. He's uh, gone completely bald, and uh, Merv often re said, look, can you keep your cap on because the reflection off the head is killing me when I'm running in the bowl and that type of stuff. But uh, didn't have a great series, uh, that particular series, but Merv had the wood on him a couple of times. 2,211 for Vivian Richards. And the score moves along to 3 for 28. It's a beautiful stroke. Still, it's better for Nerd to be up there if he's going to get a little bit of movement off the seam than uh, to be short. That's a good delivery from Merv Hughes. Gives us a good look at the new Vivian Richards haircut, which the crowd are appreciating. Vivian well aware of the comments that are coming out. Merv Hughes tried very hard to part that hair, which is not easy. played one particular game at, at the MCG where it was a rain-affected game. I suppose the, the crowd were just um, pretty well bored. And Alan Border gave me the, uh, the nod to warm up to bowl from that stage at the Bay 13 end, or the, the Punt Road end. And, um, you know, just doing the warm-ups, and you hear a bit of a roar behind you, and you look around, there's nothing going on. You think, well, what's going on here? Merv Hughes standing in front of Bay 13, and there's a bit of minicking. I think the wave is old news down there, Merv. And bowled the first over, and um, Dean Jones just walked across me and said, do you know what's going on down there? And I said, oh, no, I think they're all off their, off their rockers. And I said, oh, no, every time you do a, an exercise, you've got 10,000 people behind you doing the same exercise. And I sort of got the hat and started walking off. He said, what are you going to do now? I said, oh, 
I'm going to invent a few new exercises. So I got down there and I was, I was trying to stick my foot in my mouth and carry on like a pork chop. Um, but to, to get that sort of support from, from any crowd is fantastic. And there's, there's only one thing better than playing Test Cricket for Australia at the, at the MCG, and that's being a Victorian, playing Test Cricket or one-day cricket at the MCG. The, the crowd just really get behind you. And also because you feel on the, on the boundary line, um, you know, you can sort of interact with the crowd. Early 70s, through the 70s, and whatever it was like, any kid that, that was Victorian. Um, Aussie rules football during the winter and cricket during the summer and, and really um, didn't go far beyond those, those boundaries. As a kid, Dad played footy and cricket, so that's all I did, following the footy, and if they... If the side he played for had a little league side that played at half time, I played in that. And I used to spend a lot of time. Mum used to score for the cricket, so we used to spend all our days at cricket. And when you're at the cricket, all you do is you got a bat and ball and, and you have a hit with the other kids there. So I um, shifted up to Myrtleford for a couple of years when I was 14, 15, 16. And that, no doubt, um, in my mind, helped my progress a lot because at the age of 14, I started playing senior cricket and uh, played cricket with Dad, which was... Um, an eye opener and a, and a great experience, but to, to play senior cricket at that age um, really helped the, the development in the game. And you know, you're thinking under 14s, under 16s, you're pretty quick, and uh, you run into bowl your first over in senior cricket, and the, the wicketkeeper standing up to the stumps to you, you think, well, basically, you mightn't be that quick after all. So um, at the end of the day, you, you learn a lot in, in a short, short time, and I think uh, Myrtleford for two years taught me a lot. Then back to Werribee. Um, and Dad said it would be a backward step to go back to play junior cricket so I just um, started with the senior cricket and, and went on from there Halfway through that season of 1978 started playing senior football for Werribee and probably at that age, I, I thought that that would be the sport that I'd play because I was hoping to get picked up by, by Footscray. But in those days, it was the zones and not a draft. And I was in Geelong zone. So a couple of years on from there, went down and, and did a pre-season at Geelong that didn't really last that long um, and got selected for Victoria to play cricket that, that year. So to, to have the goals set or to have your expectations to play BFL football that was at that stage had that shattered by uh, playing cricket at, at that time I couldn't really understand it I thought yeah football was going to be the go but as it turned out uh, cricket was. Trained six weeks with with Geelong um, and uh, late November playing basketball had a broken cheekbone and at that time Geelong um, stopped training for the Christmas break and I got in the stateside New Year so that was four weeks on and it was quite handy because we were playing the Shield matches down at Cadinia Park at that time and Billy Goggin who was a coach um, had a sat down and had a talk to him and he said well we won't bother you while you've got your cricket on we'll, we'll give you a call at the end of the season um, and, and get you back down so you concentrate on your cricket and uh, we'll give you a call so I don't think he thought all that much of my football in pro S because, uh, what are we, 20 years on and never got a phone call. So, yeah, at the end of the day, um, I suppose the decision was made for me. Bowled him. Good delivery, and that was a great breakthrough for Hughes. He's bowled him, he's on a hat trick, a beautiful delivery, a Yorker, straight through the defensive throw and look at the huge. New Year's Day 1982, I think it was, uh, we played South Australia in Adelaide. Um, I was one of three new blokes selected in the Victorian side, the other two were Dean Jones and Len Balcom, left arm quick ball that I played club cricket with at, at Footscray. Um, we, uh, we bowled first and... South Australia got about 260 from memory, and my first game, uh, 10 overs, 2 for 59. I think it wasn't a great return, but the, the two wickets were, were pretty handy. Uh, the first Shield game, 
Melbourne, I was down at Cadinia Park, and um, against South Australia again, so it was a couple of weeks later. Uh, the, the McDonald's Cup game sort of gave me a bit of confidence to, to pick up two wickets there, and then um, I think two or three weeks later to be playing against the same group of, of blokes, basically, that uh, South Australia had. Um, you know, to, to have taken wickets gave me a little bit of confidence and, and went into um, the Cadinia Park game in the first Shield match with, with a bit of confidence. A regular member of the Victorian side would have been about four years later, I think. Uh, I played that season, played the first five games of the next season and broke down at Christmas with um, stress fractures, so I didn't play for the the rest of that year, and then the same thing the year after, um, and that's when I decided to give football away, to give myself every chance to, to play cricket, and at that stage probably had no real expectations of, of um, reaching test level, but um, to play with the blokes at Victorian level was a, a great learning curve for me, not just about sport, but um, about life across the board, um, and just the experience that I had with the experienced players in the Victorian side at that time was... Um, very entertaining, to say the least. 24-year-old Hughes replacement of Jeff Lawson is not surprising with Lawson just not doing enough during the series against New Zealand. Well, we played, Victoria played India at the MCG and uh, at the time I'd, I'd started the season, it was my fourth or fifth season with Victoria and um, there was talk in the, in the media that I'd be getting close to the Australian side and my philosophy was why worry about it because it might never happen and uh, walking off the, the ground and the, uh, there's a pack of journalists there just saying listen we won't ever talk to you what about and I said well you know a question we've been throwing at you for the last couple of weeks uh, the test side has been selected for the, the game against India in Adelaide and you're in it and it sort of set me back a bit and probably at, at that stage it was a uh, while there was talk about it, I didn't really believe that I was, I was going to be a chance because there were so many other um, good bowlers around at the stage. And um, I think, to, to be fair, that at that time, 85, 86, that's when the uh, Rebel Tours to South Africa came out. So a lot of the players did leave, and it did leave some gaps there. Um, and again, to, to debut for Australia, um, you know, I debuted with uh, Bruce Reid and, and Jeff Marshall. It was their first test matches uh, as well as mine. Most of the interest in the Australian camp has been the two new boys, Jeff Marsh and Big Merv Hughes, the man with a very mean moustache. They've worked very hard. Yeah, yeah I suppose a little bit of, of disbelief um, and sort of sat down with the journalist and, and got home that night and just said to, to Dad, and we sort of sat around and said, oh, you know, that's, that's fantastic. So I think um, in the end I was glad to get the Adelaide because uh, after the, the game, the game finished on a, a Monday night, I went back and played basketball um, with the side I played basketball for at the time and had a few drinks with them to celebrate the selection. And then Tuesday night was at Footscray for cricket practice and had a few drinks with them to celebrate the the, uh, the selection. And then the Wednesday night I had a few mates over because I was going to Adelaide on the, on that um, Thursday, I think it was, and the Wednesday night we had a few more beers and to celebrate. So I was pretty happy to get to Adelaide to have a rest. One lesson I've always learnt was uh, believe you're good enough to perform it at the level that you're playing. And when I got to test cricket, I, I just didn't think that I was um, good enough to be there. And probably that reflected on the performances that I had early on. Oh, and he's got him. He's out, caught behind. Murphy has just taken his first wicket in test cricket. And boy, that'll be a nice relief for him. First test match. Uh... Yeah, um, one for 123 off 37 overs, um, a fifth ball duck and I think two drop catches. So that was a pretty impressive debut. But um, probably the lesson that I, I took out of that first test match was that I thought I was doing all the right things with Victoria. Um, I'd increased the training workload and, and the quality of training that I was doing. And I saw after that first test match that it was just nowhere near enough. So if I wanted to be part of the Australian side, I'd have to go back to, to Victoria and just um, raise the bar again and, and tried to do that and just prepare myself a little bit better for the next chance I got and hopefully I was going to get another chance but um, you know to have one test and have one for 123 against your name while it was 
probably one more wicket than a lot of Australians have taken. You just get a taste at that level. And I think um, anyone that's fair thinking about what they do want, wants to do at the highest level. And with cricket, if you're doing it at the highest level, um, you get to represent your country. And I think be, there can be no greater motivation than that. So I, I just went away and, and worked and worked and worked, probably um, twice as hard or three times as hard as I had been doing the previous four years for the next um, three or four years. So. If I, if I got a, another opportunity, then I'd, I'd make the, the most of it. So I played the, the one test, got dropped, and uh, got recalled for the, the first test the next summer, which was in Brisbane against England. And uh, we copped a bit of a shellacking in, in that game, and uh, got dropped again. Again by Gatting. I think that Murphy's problem is but he thinks he's a fast bowler. And he's knocked him over. I think at the time I was asked um, ambitions um, that I'd set myself. And uh, one was to play two test matches in a row and the other one was to get a test run. So um, to, to sort of sit back and reflect on that, I, I just thought if I can play two tests in a row, um, I think that uh, it obviously means that your first test wasn't, wasn't that bad. They just tried to string it together from there. Alan Border takes over as skipper of the national side with a 2-0 deficit against the world champions, the West Indies. Looking for two here. And very well run, Jeff Thompson. Adam, to applaud what may be one of his very, very finest innings. Well, it's a big occasion and... Uh... And I'm sure the players will, will respond. Alan Border in those early days is is fantastic captain. I I must admit I felt sorry for him because I don't think he had all that much to work um, with. As as we lost a lot of senior players to the the Rebel Tour of the South Africa, and he had um, just a, a bunch of, of young men playing cricket. And while would be performing fairly well for for three of the four innings of a test match, one innings would, would let us down whether we got bowled out for 120 or whether we let the opposition just sneak away from us. And I suppose when, when you're inexperienced, you, you have to expect that. This past summer has been little short of disastrous for Australian test cricket. Not only did we lose a series for the very first time against New Zealand playing here, but we also failed to avenge that loss on a return trip across the Tasman. The performances have been of late very, very poor, and I've just had enough. The, the time that I spent in the, the Australian side to see Alan Border go from a captain of a, a young, inexperienced side and just build a team to the, um, I suppose, to, to go to the World Cup in, in 87, which I wasn't a part of, but to win that and then two years on to win the Ashes in England, um, you just saw a more relaxed Alan Border. Border stood almost numbed at the achievement. Down below, they shouted the details. Greg Campbell got a kiss from Merv Hughes in the happiest Australian dressing room for years. And Borders boys threw as much beer as they drank. My first test match was when Bob Simpson took over as coach. Um, and I had Alan Border, um, captain of, of the Australian test side, um, right throughout my career. And uh, they were just they were fantastic from my book. And, you know, to, to pick players um, at a young age and then have the, the courage to stand by those players um, and just make them into the test cricketers. They might have been talented young players that weren't quite test um, cricketers, but at the end of the day, um, you know, blokes like Jeff Marsh and Bruce Reed and you know, even Craig McDermott have played a bit of test cricket before I played and then came back into the side later on. Um, they just really worked on uh, the positive aspects of the, the game and that gave the individual players a lot of confidence. With the score at 182, he made the breakthrough. Oh, well caught. Two overs later, Hughes moved into Hooper. And caught behind. Five for 189, and the smiles were back with the Australians, especially when Border grabbed Dujon's wicket. Out, caught. For the captain, the experience was a little frightening, considering he had to withstand Merv's antics. Uh, well, that, that didn't come until um, quite a bit later, the, the tongue in the ear. Um, I suppose that was a, a phase that the, the Werribee boys were going through. It was, it was when um, basketball's becoming 
quite big in, in Australia and it was becoming very Americanised and the West Indies were, were ruling the world in cricket and every time they did something spectacular it was the high fives and uh, I was playing basketball down at Werribee with a, a group of mates that um, looked for something different to do and uh, at the end of the day if you could get your tongue in someone ear, someone's ear when they did something well it really f***ed them off um, so that was our, our motto when we played if someone does something really well let's them off and uh, towards the, uh, the middle stages of, of, the, of my career um, and particularly in Sydney when Alan Border took a lot of wickets in, in one game against the West Indies um, he took a wicket and I remember coming in sick my tongue in his ear and he just absolutely hated it and people asked me well why do you keep doing it <laughs> because he hated it so much if he, if he didn't crank up as much um, as he did when I did it I probably would have stopped but uh, yeah just the, the initial reaction that he got and, and the comments that went with it, I just thought, ah, oh, to hold with it. It's going to happen more often here. I think it's his best ever innings he's ever played. He, I don't know, he hasn't commented on what's his best ever knock, but, you know, we, we debuted for Victoria together. We've been known each other since we were 15. And he, knew, and he said to me straight away, look, you make sure you put your head down. I was 178, not out or something when he came into bat, 173, something. And he said, I'll be here. I know they've got the second new ball. I know Kirtley's got it and Courtney and Pato and Malcolm are going to try and kill him. But you make sure you get your 200 because when you do, you're going to owe me a beer for every day I'll see you after. And half century partnership in succession. Adding 63. So here's Richards. And Dean Jones wants two. Big move. What a great double turn. He's went. He's back for two. So Merv Hughes able to change direction very quickly and come back for a second. Dean Jones wanted the strike. He summed up the situation very quickly. Come on, he says. Merv hasn't quite reached the 22 yards. But the challenge, too much for Patrick Patterson. And Viv Richards not happy. He was giving Patrick Patterson to hurry up with the return. Now Merv, in the other aspect of the game, weaving his own special magic with the bat. At times it's been wielded a bit like an axe. Hasn't always been perpendicular. But behind it, a huge heart, almost as big as Farlat. But the focus now, well and truly centred on this man, Dean Jones. Can he make it 200 for the second time in his career? It won't go all the way, but a happy Dean Jones and a happy crowd here at the Adelaide Oval, including the Australian team, greeting a double century by Dean Jones, only the 11th man to score a double century in Test cricket here at the Adelaide Oval, his second in Test cricket. I remember when I got the 200, I said, one ball to go, Merv, we've got a 100 partnership, we're on a roll here, the crowd are right behind us, mate, it's the last ball before T, don't do anything stupid, just block it, because 43 plus 6 don't make 50, alright? Well, the next ball from Courtney, he just slogged it out of the ball park, <laughs> and the ball's got freak of flyer points on it, over the Vid Richardson gates, and I thought, nice block. Hughes has joined in the celebrations. That's gone for six. And as I walked off the ground, I got a tap on the shoulder. When you get your 200, you raise your bat and all that, you know, standing ovation. And Merce said, put your bat down. They're not clapping your 200, they're clapping with six. So <laughs> you always had a lot. You're no stress at all when you're back with it. First ball in Test cricket in England for Shane Warne. He started off with the most beautiful delivery. I was fielding at um, a deep backward square leg and just ran into the huddle and, you know, to see Gadding look so bemused about it, I think, what's he on about? And he, and he said, oh, I don't know. And I said, what'd that do? And Healy just said, oh, pitched off, hit off. Don't know what he's going on about. 
and uh, we all sort of turned and, and had a look at the screen, and you just think, pitched off, hit off. <laughs> like it's pitched about six inches outside leg stump for a spin bowler, a leg spin bowler. Um, you know, it's it's almost the the best delivery you could possibly bowl, and and for a batsman, as good a player of spin as Gatting was, not to get anywhere near it and have no idea uh, what was going on, I, I think that sent a huge message to to the rest of the blokes in the English room because at, at the time I think Gatting was uh, seen as their best player of spin, and when he had no idea what was going on, you you just sensed, and I think it was said in the huddle, like if Gatting's got no idea, how the rest of them going to feel. Ball, can you believe that? England had had started to to make a a fairly strong attempt to to hold out. They had to get about 500 to win the Test match in four sessions, and uh, Gooch and, and Atherton got them off to a fairly good start. Um, we picked up Atherton. Um, Shane, well, we did. Shane Warne did. I just remember coming back on for the, the spell at the end of the day, and um, and Border just expressed how important. It was to put in a big effort to, to try and get him on the, the back foot a bit and um, just uh, went with with bouncing gutting and he's, he's pulled me a couple of times and you know, the last three overs it was just a big build up to the, the last ball of the day and I think um, maybe 30,000 people there watching it and everyone everyone thought the last ball was going to be a, a short pitch ball and I think gutting had that in his mind too the way that um, his feet moved, he just went back and, and across towards leg side, I, I think just looking to maybe get out of the road of it, and uh, just pitched up, it was an attempted Yorker, and some of the scribes said that it was a, the best Yorker they've ever seen, but in fact it was a, a shin high full toss about six inches outside leg stump, that um, hit his pads and Kenner under the stumps, but uh, I'm going to take it. Well taken there by Ian Healy. It came to Gowan. We were talking about ways to get blokes out, and Jeff Lawson said, oh, bowl just short of the length down leg side to him because he tries that, that flick shot, and I've had him out caught down the leg side a few times. And everyone just sort of looked at him, oh, yeah, sure, Jeff. You're yeah, good thinking, bowl leg stump to David Gower. He's been given out. In the first innings and in the second innings, um, he got him out twice, exactly the same way, just flicking down the leg side, about a hip high ball, um, fairly tight. So Jeff bowled it, I'm pretty sure it was wide of the crease, um, angled in over leg stump just to cramp him for room. Um, and, and then Healy took two catch. We actually had a, a leg slip in place, and the fine leg moved squarer in case he just happened to, to flick it down. But um, for Jeff Lawson, like the, the recall he had on how to get um, Gary out. Everyone sort of just sat there after the test and we're just thinking, well, where's he pulled that from? Gower really, like, he really had to change his whole game plan because that's the way that we attacked him. Um, and, and Lawson seemed to get him out that way uh, a few times over that um, series. When the Victorians arrived at the airport this morning, they received a rousing welcome from students of the Tullamarine Primary School. The players appreciated the gesture, which just helped to reaffirm the importance of the match. And to me, it's the only short final that I've played in. Um, to have played at, at that stage a lot of shield cricket, and then to get to a shield final, you, you think this, you know, you give yourself every chance. We went over to Perth and, and we thought we were just, uh, you know, a, a real show like WA were with a red hot favourite, um, they had the home ground advantage. And Ray Bright decided to bat on a flat whacker wicket, but with only a dozen runs on the board, Paul Quinn was departing, courtesy of this acrobatic Tim Zorro effort. Victoria need an outright win to take home the shield, and opener Dav Watmore was playing like a man in a big hurry. It didn't last long, Peter Capes nearing his second wicket with a well thought out delivery. And we got 400 on the board, and declared we're right down. And um, Western Australia made 620 trillion. Um, Mike the letter uh, made 264, I think from here, 262 or 264, um, and just batted fantastically well. He just did what, what needed to be done. Murph Hughes to continue to Michael Valletta. Straight down the ground by Valletta, beautiful straight drive. That one's through. That should go to the boundary for four. There's a man giving chase. Will he get there? I doubt it. 
milestone coming up for this very talented young West Australian opener. And there it is. Double century to Michael Valletta. To play in that was, was really... Um, you know, just an experience to be part of a Shield final, to, to see what it was like to play in a Shield final. And even though we went down, probably the thing that I hold is that we didn't get beaten. Um, you know, they, they probably dominated for five days, but uh, the one saving grace, I think, that, that we could hold our heads high was that we didn't get beaten. It was a drawn game. A desperate lunge by skipper Dean Jones just failed to give Hughes his first wicket. Moments later, the big man was forced from the field midway through and over due to a groin strain. It's unknown the extent of the injury, but it could prevent him from playing out the rest of the game and jeopardise his second test chances. I've played 10 years for Victoria and never beaten Western Australia in Western Australia. Um, in fact, I, I, don't, I can't remember ever beating Western Australia in a one-day game or a Shield match. We might have had a couple of draws or we might have had first innings points, but to play after, to play after 10 years, um, to go over to Perth and to knock WA over at full strength, um, was just a highlight for me. It... After clinching their third outright win of the season, it was an exhausted Victorian side which arrived back from Perth today. Not too exhausted though. Even with Hughes injured, the Vicks produced the goods. They come out throwing a few punches, a few falls to hit, and it was just very good for them. But sooner or later, one of them was going to go out, and thank God it did. We grabbed the stump out of the ground. The bloke said, what are you doing that for? <laughs> Ten years, mate. TFY it was. So that, that game will always, I'll always remember as TFY. Ten years it was. Despite the long flight which followed a five hour delay at Sydney Airport, the Australian players were in high spirits when they faced the British media. For Captain Alan Border, it's his third visit to England as part of a team trying to win the Ashes, the second time as captain. It's something that I would like to achieve, obviously having missed out in 81 and 85, and as captain in 85, obviously there's a greater sense of uh, wanting to achieve in 89, so, but not really personally, I'd just like to do it as uh, just part of the career statistics, if you like, and just, uh, it's a special thing to win a test series in England uh, would be very special. The man expected to be the character of the tour, fast bowler Merv Hughes, is on his first trip and was also ready to parry questions. You have a reputation yourself of having quite a good time there. Are we going to see that? Or are you just never know that? <laughs> but for the last word on our chances, it was left to Alan Border. As I said, the batting, bowling, everything hopefully is good enough for what, what it takes. Um, no particular weaknesses, no particular strengths as such. We're just a uh, good all-round side. We got um, pounded as the worst Australian side ever to leave the shores in, a, in an Ashes um, tournament. And to go over there and to be part of, of that tour, it was my first tour with the Australian um, team, to get over there and, and to, to win the series 4-0 um, was just fantastic. And probably people don't understand the planning that went into it, but Alan Border played two years of county cricket before that tour and every time we came up against a, a batsman or a bowler that you know we hadn't heard of he played against him in county cricket and just you know did the homework for, for two years and at that stage cricket was um, seen as semi-professional but the attitude that that we took as a team on that that tour was was very professional 67 the australian fielding was of match winning quality gooch was then joined by the dangerous lamb okay got him he's gone England didn't seem to know whether to play for a win or a draw. Gooch held out for a half century, well, once but once again, Gower's downfall was that leg side wave. And well taken there by Ian Healy. Three balls later, Lawson to Smith. And well taken by Border. Now England were desperate, but Gooch continued to punish everything until Merv Hughes came back on. Good shot. He's got it. No, he's got it. Hot weather and a school line of six for 153 had the locals trying anything to break the Australian field's concentration. At one point, there were two streakers on Headingley, and just like them, England were quickly removed. In the air, he's got him! Great catch! Marsh's brilliant catch gave Alderman ten for the match. Merv Hughes delivered the formality at the end, giving Border his second test win outside Australia and the team's first at Leeds for 25 years. A celebration in the Australian dressing room tonight.
So often asked to explain Australia's failure, Border said the important work was done after lunch. Um, and as it turned out, the middle session was, uh, well, the, the big one, six wickets and a couple of streakers, sensation. And they said basically our batting was pretty sound, but we wouldn't bowl sides out. So to be part of a, the combination that played for, for the, the six test matches, uh, Greg Campbell was the only change, he played the, the first test match, uh, got dropped, Trevor Holmes came in for the, the next five test matches, um, so it was Alderman, Lawson, Holmes and myself, um, with with Steve Waugh bowling a, a little bit, to to have to be part of that combination was, was very satisfying. That's bowled him, clean bowled him. A quarter of an hour later, Alderman had Curtis standing square. Just a fact we've got him, yes! Two for 13. Once again, England's hopes hung precariously, and very much on first inning century maker Robin Smith for another long dig. Magnificent. You know, Robin Smith was, was one bloke that, that really stood up to it. Um, and the, the running battle I had with him throughout that series and, and the other series that we played against him, um, a lot of people would think that, you know, we must hate each other. But at, at the end of the day, um, you know, I've got the utmost respect for Robin Smith as a player and as a bloke because what was said on the ground stayed on the ground. Um, you know, and at the, at the end of the series, I, I suppose the mark of respect that I, I showed him is that I, that I wanted to swap sort of hat, cap and jumper with him at the end of the tour because I just enjoyed the way that he played the game. But his main series rival Merv Hughes displaced him for 26. Oh, By now, the future of England couldn't come quick enough, although in Mike Atherton, who graduated from Cambridge to Country Colours, there was some degree of improvement. Another fine square drive from Atherton. But Moxon departed when Alderman dismantled a 39-run oh, stand. That one stayed down and hit off stump. And then Lawson wrecked Russell's castle to leave England five for 118. We involved him. That one's Two runs later, Atherton was brilliantly removed by Holmes for 47. Oh, he's caught him. What a great catch. Caught and bowled. Steve Waugh claimed a fair catch to remove Eddie Hemmings, but the umpires didn't agree and the 40-year-old stood his ground. Fieldsman says he's caught it. Although Lawson gave him a piece of his mind when they walked off to tea. The stocky slogger made a useful 35 before Hughes trapped him. He's given in. And almost. When Merv removed Malcolm cheaply, England were all out for 167. The Australians had gone four up in the series to equal the achievements of Don Bradman's 1948 side. I suppose in 20 years' time, we'll look back and think, you know, we were pretty good. At the moment, it's just hard to sort of relate to 1948. I suppose that was really the turning point of Australian cricket at test level. But um, for me, the turning point came in the World Cup in 87. Uh, Australia won that. Um, then we played a home series against the West Indies. Um, we got beaten 3-1 there. Yeah. And then to go to England and to win that, I, I think uh, a lot of people just didn't expect it. If I've got a ball in my hand, um, you know, the bloke, bloke with the bat in his hand, I, I don't want him there. As a player, you're out in the ground, and it, to me, my attitude was it was easier to hate the bloke at the other end, um, but if you got to know him in a crunch situation, subconsciously you might just ease up on him. So I'd, I'd go in at the end of the tour when the, the series was over and have a drink and you know, have a laugh and a bit of a talk about the series it was or whatever, but I didn't really want to get too friendly with any of the opposition. With the Viv Richards Pavilion officially opened and Tegans couldn't hold back their emotions, the Australians won the toss but lost Marsh early. Three runs later, Australia was in more trouble. Boone gone without scoring. Two for 13. Border was then given a nasty welcome. But with Mark Taylor set about rebuilding the Australians' innings. Tremendous backward shot by Mark Taylor. After lunch, the pair continued to cane the Windies' attack, bringing up a 100 stand. Lovely shot for four. Taylor moved to 50, and Border followed soon after. Alan Border gets his first half century of the series. 
But with the score on 129, Carl Hooper finally broke through. Fans were now back in holiday mode as Hooper completed a valuable double. And a big shout from Geoffrey Dujon. But just when most thought Australia was on that familiar downhill road, Mark War and Dean Jones applied the brakes. Long on, but it's going to clear him. War was in great touch, but on 97, nearly fell to Richards. With a prize life, he made sure of his first ton against the Windies. And Mark War has become the first Australian ever to hit a test century on this Antigua ground. I'm pretty sure... West Indies had never been beaten in Antigua by Australia or, or whether it was by anyone. Um, to win there was important to show that we had a little bit of, of fight in us. Although we'd lost the series, we come out and, and a lot of people say that you know the West Indies were good at, at losing games that didn't count, but any test match you, you play counts. Resuming at five for 355, Australia relied on war, but he ran out of partners. The last five wickets falling for just 48 runs. The home team had the crowd doing strange things as McDermott sparked a West Indian collapse. He's gone. Greenwich had made six. Soon after, McDermott to Richardson. Well, he's dragged it on. Two for 22. And then Hughes joined in the act, trapping Hooper. We don't much plum in front. And he was convinced he had number two bowling to Haynes. After a heated exchange, the pair made up. And the friend the kiss as well. While Haynes was lucky, his skipper left no doubt. And there's another one. Yes, that indeed is gone. Logie came out but seemed to be playing the wrong sport. Almost looked as though he was trying to nod it into the corner of the net with the goalkeeper going the other way. After the interval, McDermott took his fourth, the valuable wicket of Haynes. Oh, yes, yes. Then Dujon made the mistake of picking out the brilliant Dean oh, Jones. Would you believe that? With a lead of 189, um, the Australians had to survive a tenth few overs up. against the fire of Ambrose. To play the West Indies in the West Indies is, is a tough ask, and it could have been quite quite easy for for us as a side to go down three nil. But um, to come out and to to hold sway against the West Indies, who at the time were considered the best in the world, two one was was an important game. They'd come dressed for the occasion, one of the regulars giving the young ones a lesson in cricket comfort. You know, have the one and a half piece suit. Healy also looked less than elegant, adding a quick 32 before Logie scooped up a gem. Taylor kept his concentration. And what he's got there to add to it. Boone went to Walsh, inspiring an invasion. Off the inside edge. The band leaders danced off to prepare the next act. Border came out for his 215th test innings. No one in the history of the game has had as many in test cricket. It was one of his shortest, though, bowled by Walsh for five. Very good delivery there from Courtney Walsh. That was just what the doctor ordered. Ambrose got into step, but it was Walsh doing the damage. And... Jones gone. Next ball, Walsh to Mark War. <laughs> Peter Taylor denied Walsh's hat trick. Mark went on to make his ton. And there's the century for Mark Taylor. Like, there's, there's some games you, you'll never forget, and that's one game I'll never forget. And we beat him in, inside four days, so we had the fifth day off. And just the, the fifth day, you know, the, the boys just... It could have been quite easy to, for everyone to go their own way and do their own thing, but the boys just really hung really tight together. And, and that, to me, just showed that we were a really tight-knit unit and, and that we could we could go places in the future. The day demanded something special from everyone. Gravy's fixation with stockings taking a new twist. For an early Christmas, the Windies wanted a piece of history. And that brings up the 50. While ever Greenwich partnered Haynes, the largest ever winning total looked possible. Merv's bowling deserved better, and in a backhanded way, he got revenge on Haynes. What? Would you believe it? Haynes couldn't resist a parting shot, and when Greenwich hesitated on a vague call from Richardson, Boone's arm finished off the Windy's hard outer shell. And Greenwich is out. At lunch, two for 98. Afterwards, Richardson was still ravenous. But the persistence of Mark War and the fielding of Jones produced a spectacular breakthrough. What a brilliant piece of work again. Richards came in on a pair for a last dig on his home strip, Border ruined the farewell. 
And that's another wicket to Alan Border. The Windies had lost three for 95 in the session, and when Dujon went without another run added, the final stages were an exercise in avoiding embarrassment. Marshall's 50 helped. That's good placement by uh, Malcolm Marshall. From there, the hard-working Hughes triggered the demolition of three for none to rubber stamp the result. The Windies made the history books all right, but as the first team to lose at St John's. For Border, it helped make up for all those lost chances. It was just important to us all that we, we finished our season of cricket off on a high note, and we've done just that. All that Windies team that, that played in Antigua was uh, Greenwich, Haynes, Richie Richardson, Bib Richards, um, Carl Hooper, Gus Logie, Malcolm Marshall, Geoffrey Dujon, Kirtley Ambrose, Patrick Patterson, Courtney Walsh. But I can't remember them too well. <laughs> times Joe Angel strikes the West Indies now three for 184 it's well played onto the front foot nice straight drive fieldsman at the door quite wide so once again Adams getting the ball to the boundary oh he's bowled in he drags that back onto the stumps the stump has been knocked out of the ground oh bold nerve Hughes the Australians they're just quietly creeping up on the West Indians. They've uh, got themselves quite a big deficit to make up, but the fact of the matter is they're getting wickets, and as long as they keep doing that, they may just be able to get themselves back into this match. It's a crucial blow. Jimmy Adams getting the inside edge. And the stump ending up out of the ground. It's a good sign. Always a, a lovely sound for the fast bowler to hear. Jimmy Adams bowled Murph Hughes for eight. The West Indies... Four for 195. Yeah! An enormous shout. Hughes is not interested. But umpire Timmons is eventually, and Desmond Haynes goes very quickly once the finger was raised. It's a long delay. Desmond, with the weight of that plaster on his cheekbone, unable to get his eyes up to catch those of the umpire. I don't think Desmond Haynes was interested in walking until he saw that finger go up. He just stood there. Where he was, wasn't interested in looking back at the umpire. He was very confident that there was an edge. Desmond Haynes goes. It's now 5 for 205, the West Indies. Yeah. And it's hit leg stump. Courtney getting a long way across there. So far that he's left leg stump exposed. And Murph Hughes has hit it. So once again, it's been the fine bowling of Murph Hughes and Craig McDermott that have done the job for Australia. They picked up seven wickets between them. Murph confused the ball by getting it away over square leg. In fact, has allowed it to go for four just to make certain that uh, there was no chance of getting five. Nicely placed. Bishop will do the chasing there. Pretty well timed by Healy also. It's 7 for 140. That's a very good blow. Given that someone with that beefy bat. Well, Big Mervyn Hughes has give that one the full swing of that rather large bat that he uses. And that one's cleared the pickets over mid on. And that is uh, the end of Murph Hughes. Courtney Walsh has got him. Looked like a top edge. Junior Murray. Hey, there's a camera on here. <laughs> oh, bull <laughs> didn't see it. See this red light? <laughs> they filming us. <laughs> Just ignore it. I'm not a sightseeing person. I mean, we don't get that much time off. And when we train in the mornings before the test matches, whatever, um, you just get the feet up in the afternoon and and have a snooze.
Hey guys, have you ever looked at the architecture in the mm-hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? It's fantastic. Look at the way the signs are stuck to the wall there. The English papers just uh, try and pick up on, on everything. And just, yeah, this is England, isn't it? Hmm. Not bad. Could be the other. Act natural. Act natural. Well, I'm going to get pissed in on. <laughs> They're all looking for the sort of the beer drinking party and elbows that sort of just come over here and, and have a good time. But um, you know, if you just party all the time and you don't sort of work too hard, then uh, you, you're not going to be in the team for too long. This is Australia's newest sporting hero, the man all of England talked about over a painfully long northern summer. Mervyn Gregory Hughes, a one-time unfashionable fast bowler from the still unfashionable Melbourne suburb of Werribee. An army sergeant major would be proud of the huge short back and sides, but with that solitary salute to sleekness, the rest is pure Merv. A kilo or two of heavily cultivated mo, and another hundred or so holding it up. Yeah. Oh, you put on a kilo. That's it. Is that good? We're short. Is that the fighting weight? No, he's down. He's down. Four. I'm fighting the way to a shadow. He's down four and a half kilos from the start of tour. 105. That's close to the way you should Look at that. Sorry, sir. 104. Push it a bit harder. Uh, 100. You lose the weight all the time, eh? It's a good diet, isn't it? Good diet. What about the food? Do you like food? Love food. Too much food or? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Is the weight a problem? Um, yeah, it's always a problem, I suppose. Um, you know, I like, I like eating. I enjoy a few beers and... I mean, I just stack on weight um, very easily. Well, it's not a worry on the shorter term. It's a grave worry for us, though, on the injury situation because we believe, and why we hound him so much about his weight, is that he may well be cutting down his own career and robbing us of uh, a couple more years of Merv Hughes. So that's always our concern. Oh, big appeal there. He's got him out, LBW. He's played right across that one, and Merv Hughes has struck again. Isn't he amazing? Australia will miss the Hughes magic this summer. A knee operation will sideline him until the new year. No doubt the antics will continue, as usual, from the sidelines. Hughes is now one of six Australians to take 200 test wickets and is one run short of being the 10th player in test history to score 1,000 runs as well. That's a good delivery. He's taken his off stump with a nice little leg cutter, drifting in in the air and then just straightening up would have knocked over a lot better players than Martin McCaig as Mervyn Hughes just rounds up his wickets now at 202. Above him on the bowling list are the elite of Australian cricket. Revered names like Lilly, Benno, Mackenzie, Lindwool and Grimmett. These are cricket's greats. Add to that list the snarling, huffing Hughes, the boyish larrikin, the trundler who came into test cricket with brute strength and enthusiasm and converted that by sheer hard work into intimidating pace, a mixture of fire and guile. <laughs> Thousands of youngsters around the world aspire to be like Merv Hughes, and here he is, this is his secret. <laughs> in fact, I'm sure there's 16 other guys in the squad who just like to be like Merv. What's his heart like? Uh, probably as big as his stomach. <laughs> no, he's uh, tremendous, you know. That's probably, you know, the, one of his greatest qualities is, uh, you know, he's ticker and he's out in the field. You, you know you're in a contest and he never says die. Uh, he's, he's had a few injuries over the years and he just gets through them. You know, he's bigger than Ben-Hur. How was that, Errol? <laughs> Turn back the clock to 1985, Australia versus India. For Merv Hughes, the first test, the first wicket. Oh, and he's got him. He's out, caught behind. Merv Hughes has taken his first wicket in test cricket. And boy, that'll be a nice relief for him. Um, ben Saka caught Phillips Bulges in Adelaide. I think it was 123. And that was your figures for the uh, the innings? Yep. Do you remember getting carded that test? Yep. <laughs> Chris Streetcamp. Three point at pace a number of times. Away it goes again. Probably... 
uh, the, the greatest motivation I've had to succeed is the early days that I played where uh, you pick up the papers for, for Victoria and, and even Australia and, and you've got blokes just canning and saying that you just can't play. And I mean, Merv Hughes, more out. than anybody in the Australian team on that four-month tour of England, knew the pressure of public examination and how to handle that scrutiny. Come on. Put a camera before him and he starts preening. Enter Hughes the Clown. The media that he once avoided has become his plaything. He's an ugly brute, isn't he? The English press called him the village idiot. The mo, the bulging gut, the unfashionable haircut, the beady stare. Whatever the image, he is the most popular cricketer in the game. Well, well, he's affectionately known to us as the fruit fly, you know, because he's an absolute pest. He never um, shuts up. He's talking all the time, as, as everybody would know on the cricket field. But I suppose what you see on the field is more or less what you get with Merv. Uh, he's boisterous and likes to have a good time, and have a bit of joke, and always doing the quick joke or the one line or something, and is always making you laugh. And most of the time, he makes you feel pretty good. It was the last tour that was a real problem. I'm, I had him as a roommate for all the tests, and every night he'd come home and I'd be asleep and. He wakes you up by just licking your face and putting his tongue in your ears. Who had the mo first? I'm not sure. I'm a year older than him, so I'll say I did. You weren't born <laughs> with it too, were you? No, not quite. But um, every so often I just trim mine up because I don't like being called Merv Hughes' love child. Him? Yeah. Excellent. Is he? Yeah. And is he a good bloke? Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you like about him? He's moustache. Sure, I love can I please get one of those sumo shirts? At first, Hughes bristled when he was nicknamed the sumo by the English crowds. Are you selling many of them? Quite a few, yeah. Are you? Yeah. Well, they all like the Merv Hughes look, do they? I think so. <laughs> How much are they? Then he turned it to an advantage, earning a royalty on every shirt sold. His marriage to Sue a year ago quietened some of the larrikin in Merv, but like his success on the field, the final vows came after a long haul. How did you meet her? Uh, Castle Hotel, North Melbourne, about seven, eight years ago. Well, was she just standing there with the girls? Yeah. I'll and you used there. a bit of the charm? I'll stand there with the boys, she'll stand there with the girls, and she didn't want to name me for the first five years, but I kept chasing her. I wore her down. And Hughes is well aware that his on-field antics are worth money. He may well play the fool, but he's no fool. His larger-than-life personality is his investment in the future. Merv's the sort of guy that, if I was a captain, uh, I would want him on my side. He's uh, a centre of attraction on the side. He's a big heart. He'll run in all day for you, and he'll give you everything he's got. What more can you want? to 89 um, quite often I get asked to compare the two tours and, and you just can't I mean uh, they were fantastic for for um, different reasons and and 93 um, to be a senior player in that side um, the side that we have you know we had a good chance of winning but um, as Border pointed out you know that's what England were thinking in 89 so if we went over there thinking that we're a good chance to win and we just fairly complacent about the way we approached it, then we're, we're going to get a, a rude awakening. Caddick didn't even Bowl see the Hughes delivery, nice. which cannoned into his pads. Oh, that's got to be close. Yes, you're giving him out, LBW. Hughes's 200th test wicket. Really Next ball, 201. Oh, that's, that's got to be out too. Yes, he's got him. Martin McCaig had to hold out the hat oh, trick. He survived to take up the challenge, but the Aussie quick got his revenge with a leg cutter. That's a good delivery. He's taken his off stump. While the crowd interest was elsewhere... Umpire yeah, Dickie Bird sensed the end for England. Appropriately, it was Alan Border who sealed England's face. Be Alan Border underneath that and takes the catch to win the series. Uh, won the first test, won the second test, and probably it's, it's safe to say the more we won, the more we wanted to win. And I think it was the harder we trained because we realised that, that England would be, be coming out at us. Got him. Yes, beautiful piece of ball. For me, in 93, the unsung hero 
of that tour was Tim May. Um, while Shane Warne uh, grabbed the, the headlines and, and took 34 wickets, and he did bowl uh, magnificently well, um, Tim May's effort virtually went unnoticed. He played in, in five test matches and uh, took 22 wickets, which was fantastic, and did a, a lot of bowling. And if, if Julian um, May and Rifle hadn't bowled as well as they did, we really would have struggled. This was not a good day for Craig McDermott. Too many no balls and not a wicket to his name. Then, in his frustration, he ignores skipper Alan Border. Hey, 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 what do? Talk to you, come here. Come here, come here. Come here. To shocked laughter from the crowd, the paceman answers back. He's threatened with a ticket home. And then one final warning. The captain's language coloured a day when Australia won well, beating Somerset by 35 runs. But the British media was making the most of the bust up. England's bid to regain the Ashes received an unlikely boost today. Australia's captain Alan Border was involved in an on-the-field slanging match with his father. Craig McDermott seemed angry at all the fuss. Can you talk to your captain about what had happened? Was uh, we were bowling and we we're getting hit around a bit, and. Um, after an over, Border just went up, patted McDermott on the backside and said, you know, um, I need a really big effort or something like that. And McDermott just sort of stopped and turned around and went, he said, what do you mean? I said, just keep up the effort. As long as you, you're saying I'm not having a go. And it sort of flared from there and, and AB just ripped into it. And they had microphones there and it just captured the whole conversation. Now I'm at the other end of the ground at, at fine leg coming up to bowl. Um, so I run in and, and bowl and just wasn't aware what was going on. Oh, that's just the captain. I mean, he's, he's got the right to do that. And we found out what had happened, and it was just one of those things that, that happened, like um, Border was just asking for a big effort from McDermott, and McDermott took it as though um, Border thought he wasn't having a go, and it just sort of flared from there. And I think the best call of all time was, don't answer me back or you'll be the next plane home. <laughs> and, and you just thought, I, I heard that in the TV. Um, after I did the interview. I thought, when did, this, when did this happen? I was sitting in the row, I can't remember who I was rooming with. When did this happen? Oh, that happened the day after about the fifth over. <laughs> What's going on here? So while it was a, a big deal in the media, and um, I understand it was, it was a bit of a big thing here, um, basically it was, it was nothing to the team. Inside the dressing room, three months of pressure was released. <laughs> The Ashes squad of 93 had felt they'd been living in the shadow of the 89 team. They now have their own niche in history. <laughs> Leading the celebration, Merv Hughes, who'd just become the seventh Australian to take 200 test wickets. <laughs> For Alan Border, this victory was all the sweeter because it followed an English revival at Trent Bridge. To come here to Headingley with a, a question mark hanging over the team, I suppose, and England uh, favoured to do well here, uh, it just feels really special to, to clinch the Ashes 3-0 with uh, two to play. In the rooms, no one was spared. Not the coach. <laughs> not the injured and absent Craig McDermott. Not reporters. <laughs> The Aussies play their next county match on Wednesday. Motivation will be a problem. Oh, the arrival of the Australian cricketers put an even greater glint in the eye of these youngsters, not to mention the Soweto sports chiefs, who expected only a few players to come out, only to discover the entire touring party volunteered. Oh, I felt it. It. Craig McDermott and Merv Hughes were astonished by what they saw. Boy. <laughs> I've really got myself to blame for um, my performance in South Africa because after I got told my knee um, was as bad as it was and I probably wouldn't play cricket for, for three months, basically a, a lot of people wrote me off and said that I wouldn't play test cricket again. And I, I really set my sights um, to, to play test cricket again and nothing more. And when I got back to the, the test squad to go to South Africa, then played the first test in South Africa, um, basically I, I achieved what I, what, what I wanted to. And um, instead, of, instead of doing that, um, I didn't 
once I achieved what I, the goal that I set, I didn't readjust it. And um, probably that's uh, the biggest mistake that I've made in the career. Hughes and May put on a defiant last wicket stand and Rain could have been the visitors' salvation with players forced from the ground minutes before the tea break. But they returned almost immediately. Two balls later, it was over. Oh, big appeal there, giving him out. May walk. Appropriately, the wicket fell to man of the match, Hansi Cronje. And the South Africans had cause for celebration. Their sixth consecutive test win over Australia on home soil since 1967. Played um, two tests in South Africa, got dropped after the, the second one, which we won in Cape Town. Um, we went to Durban and, and didn't play cricket for Australia again after that. Border joined Mark War at the crease to bury their hopes. Slowly but surely, the test was getting out of South Africa's reach. Oh, he's got that one away. And a century no to war was just reward for his match saving innings. And there it is. The focus quickly moved from War, though. As stumps were called almost an hour early, it was Alan Border who took centre stage, the curtain coming down on one of the most decorated careers in history. I just had a real sad feel about the whole day. He, he really batted well to, to save the game. Him and Mark War um, batted for a long time to save the game. And to walk off the ground, normally Alan Border would be happy with that. And sort of looked at him and it was as though... He knew it was going to be his last test, and, and that was a feeling that I got. And there was a, a lot of conjecture over the next couple of, of months whether it was going to be or at the... You know, and in the end, um, he retired, but I don't think he was all that comfortable with, with that decision. But, yeah, at the time, it just seemed like um, it, it was going to be his last game. And yeah, it was just a, a really... Why well, we'd hung on to, to um, draw the series to and draw that test match after being... Um, a little bit out of it, um, you just sort of sat back and there was there was no sense of relief, there was no sense of, um, you know, we haven't lost a series. It was just a, a sense, it was almost a sadness that um, Alan Border was, was probably not going to play cricket for Australia again. As if Australia's pride didn't take a big enough battering from defeat in the first test, now comes the indignity of being censured by its own cricket board. The ACB uh, has come down heavily on Shane Warne and Merv Hughes the over these incidents on day three of the match. Referee Donald Carr issued token fines of less than $500 to each of the players. Today, they well, felt the fury from back Dr. home. But the conduct of Shane Warne and Merv Hughes in Johannesburg on Sunday was unacceptable. Yeah, just emotions were, were running fairly high. Um, we got over there. Um, South Africa batted. Whether we won the toss or they won the toss, I've got no idea, but uh, they batted. Uh, we bowled them out for a reasonable score. Um, we chased, and the scores were pretty tight. And then um, Hansi Cronje came out and made 122 in the second innings and just just um, batted magnificently. The level of frustration has been brewing for some time on this tour. During the rain break yesterday, Hughes reacted savagely to yet another barrage of abuse from spectators. Probably the thing that I felt very disappointed by was that um, none of the Australian press had asked me what had happened. They just went in, um, went on their stand and that uh, I tried to hit this bloke. And at no stage did I try and hit him. Like, show the footage and I hit well down. Um, but they said that I lost control and it was, it was a, a really funny... I, I can remember it so clearly. I, I can't actually remember what he said to me. I just sort of heard uh, an earful, just copped an earful and sort of turned around. He's having a go at Tim May and I walked back. I had my bat in the hand and his fingers were up over the top of the fence. And I was thinking, like, just it all seemed to happen in slow motion. I was thinking, if I can get my bat on the right angle here, I can break eight fingers. And I've gone back and I thought, oh, no, I just hit the, there was a, a tin fencing thing there. And he sort of jumped back and I got over the fence and said, listen, mate, you've got something to say, let's hear it. And a little bit more colourful language, I suppose. And he sort of backed off a bit. And I just said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You're like every other person I've met over here. You're as weak as <laughs> And that was it. And walked in. And um, at no stage did I try and hit him. Um, because I think if I if I wanted to hit him, I could have just knocked his head off. Because he, he was he didn't even see me coming until I, I sort of hit the fence. And um, a lot of people are under the the belief that I, I got fined four thousand dollars for that. I got I got fined four thousand dollars for an on field um, discretion, um, and that I got a uh, two thousand dollar suspended fine. So I, I didn't actually get fined for that incident. So I ended my test career the same way I started it, in a blaze of glory. None for 24 off 12, none for 28 off 12 overs. First ball duck, but I fielded well.
Over winter, Merv Hughes has been visiting towns across Australia, passing on the benefit of his experience to the next generation of cricketers. Now his own future with Victoria is in grave doubt. Hughes was summoned home by new coach John Scholes for a chat at state training. I think I've got some bad news waiting for me when I get back. Despite being a member of the pre-season squad, the big man has struggled with his training routine. They cut it down from um, 31 to, to 25. And uh, I don't think it's all that good news when the coach wants to talk to you before training. When you're 26, you think you're going to play forever, or 28, 29, you, you think you're going to play forever, and uh, you get to 31, 32, and you're just looking for the back door out. Now people ask me, how do you miss it? And definitely the thing that I miss most is the, the personnel, um, blokes that you played cricket with for, for 10 years in the, in the Victorian team for, for longer than that, um, and you're just you're not around it, um, but. You know, to, to say that I actually miss playing, um, I still play club cricket. Um, so you, you get that cricket fix once a week, and that's probably all the body's capable of doing. So you, you still get that, that cricket fix, and, and you're with the boys. Um, and I definitely don't miss the, the 20 sessions of, of training a week that you used to do, and definitely don't miss not being able to walk for, for four or five days after a game. When, uh, when I first came into the, the Victorian team, um, a quote that, that probably uh, typified my career was um, he just told me, treat every game like it's your last, because it could well be. Um, so basically, every time I stepped on the ground, um, I thought it was going to be my, my last game, and just played accordingly, because you, you don't know what's around the corner. Um, you know, and and if, if you're slacking off, you're not going to be there. So, you know, the, the words of wisdom um, for me, translated to you know, just go full tool all the time because if you don't and, and you don't succeed, uh, you're not going to be around. 